أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم ولعن أعداءهم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your a'mal, accept your salat, accept your fast. And insha'Allah ta'ala, I ask Allah um, for us to benefit as much as we can from this month. Today, my brothers and sisters, we're going to be discussing a more practical topic as opposed to the one that we discussed yesterday, where we asked, what is God? And we had more or less a two-day series, if you want to call it that, two-day lecture. Um, on the topic where we discussed our Sunni brothers and sisters, what they say or what is said, what is found in the books, the Christian, our Christian um, um, friends, what they say in their books as well. And also um, what is what is found in the book, uh, the, the uh, Old Testament. So the, the book that's accepted by both sides. Then we more or less showed what we believe, my brothers and sisters, and we said that Ahlul Bayt told us that the question about what God is, what Allah is, does not pertain to God. As in the question itself is wrong. We said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be understood by the intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be confined to a place for us to say that he has a body. And by saying that Allah ta'ala has a body, it is essentially saying, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is made up of parts. And if he's made up of parts, well, we run into the dilemma. What came first, God or the parts? If we say God came first, then what's the use of the parts? And if we say parts came first, then those parts have to have come together to make God, which means God was not always there. It was not azali. Jamil. Jamil. We discussed this. We looked deeper into this. And the practical point of what we discussed is that these ideas that we have, my brothers and sisters, this rich, rich knowledge that we find in the books of Ahadith is not just knowledge to be confined by the four walls of our Masajid and Husayniyat. Rather, this knowledge, my brothers and sisters, needs to be in the universities. This knowledge needs to be in the textbooks, in the books. It is, it is a disgrace for Muslims that someone who is not a Muslim finds something and then later on we raise our hand and say that was in the Quran 1400 years ago. If it was in the Quran 1400 years ago, if it was in your hadith, then why didn't you present it? Why did you wait for the Westerner, for the non-Muslim to write it in his or her book and then later on say, oh, this was in the Quran. That's a disgrace. It's not, it's not something that we should be proud of. Us as Muslimin, especially Shias, followers of Ahlul Bayt, our books are rich with philosophical topics, with scientific facts, with things that science has either yet to discover or have discovered just recently. Philosophers have yet to speak about, yet to present, or have presented just recently. And it's on us, my brothers and sisters, to show that to humanity today. Jamil. That is what we discussed yesterday, very, very brief. Today, my brothers and sisters, we're going to discuss a practical topic, also a two-day topic, inshallah ta'ala, whether, whether we have to do one day today and then the day after, or uh, two days after we, we complete it for Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam's uh, wilada coming in the middle or not, we can, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do inshallah ta'ala. But this discussion is going to be another two-day long lecture. And the discussion, my brothers and sisters, is around the idea of Islamic modernization, where we're going to ask, does Islam need to be modernized? And the premise of the question, my brothers and sisters, is extremely important to understand. Why in today's day and age is this idea of Islamic modernization being pushed? What's the reason behind so many people that are influential having such ideas of modernizing, changing, molding Islam. Why is this idea resonating so much, especially with the youth? And why is the West especially one of the greatest advocates for this idea of molding Islam, changing Islam, modernizing Islam? Well, understand, my brothers and sisters, in the era that we live in today, it's a very, very special era. 
very, very special time in human history where if you wanted to look at human advancement compared to time, if you wanted to plot that out, maybe in the last 200, 300 years, do you find a spike in human advancement on, in terms of technology, in terms of social reform, in terms of the judicial system and what we consider good versus what we consider evil as a collective society, as a nation, as a people? You find that humanity in the last 300 or so years have spiked in terms of their advancement as a species. Technology is on the rise. Social justice is something that all humans, no matter of status, no matter of wealth, can partake in. The judicial system does not, outwardly, does not differentiate between male or female, does not differentiate between rich or poor, does not differentiate between famous and unknown. So you find humans have found a way in the last 300 years to advance as a species on multiple different levels and in many different scapes. Jamil, in the very same respect, in the very same respect, human beings also felt, always feel as though the past is something that is regressive. The past is something that if we hold on to, we are moving backwards. And so this idea that holding on to, on to the traditions of the past is regressive made its way also into the way we view things, where we felt that technology was on a constant rise and we are benefiting. Technology is constantly changing and we are benefiting from that. Therefore, therefore, the same must apply to the traditions that we believe in or the traditions that we apply, whether those traditions are cultural or those traditions are religious. So you find that today, even if a person has just come from the Middle East, give them a year, two years, three years, it's a melting pot. They have almost assimilated to the degree where they lost their identity because this is what's pushed on them. This is the pressure that is being pushed on such an individual. Leave your traditions and assimilate with everyone else, conform with everyone else. Similar is, it, is the case when it comes to religious ideas, that these ideas have been practiced for 1,400 years, and they must be modernized and changed to fit our values of today, especially, especially Western values, where Western values are making their way even to the most remote part of the earth, parts of the earth and changing the way people think in the most repart place I'm in the most remote places on earth so you find this push for islamic modernization a different view for islam is something that many people hold those people might sit beside you in the mosque those people might be the presidents of your mosques those people might be in hawzat so called hawzat seminaries islamic seminaries it is not specific to the layman's person. Rather, you find this idea as being pushed even in so-called advanced and modern hawzat, seminaries. So today, my brothers and sisters, we want to dwell into the issue. We want to discuss the issue objectively. We want to present the different theories. We want to present the different theories and a history of those theories just the same. See what we can discuss about them. Nitpick the theories, critique them. And then finally present, present what our ulama have presented as, uh, as their own theory. We will begin insha'Allah with Allah salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Before we begin with the discussion, before we begin looking at the theories, one point has to be understood. When we discuss human modernization, my, or sorry, not human. Islamic modernization, I still haven't had a thought yet. So if I make mistakes, please do. Uh, please do forgive me. When we discuss Islamic modernization, we are not discussing the beliefs of Islam. When it comes to the beliefs of Islam, the fundamental ideas of Islam, usul al din these are not ideas that we are discussing about whether we should modernize them or not. Because the ideas of belief, my brothers and sisters, are either found in your books or they're not found in your books. In terms of application, they don't much play much of a role. As in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the way that he has his attributes. This idea is not something that needs to be modernized. Maybe the way that you present it, maybe. 
But the idea itself, the idea itself doesn't change anything on the ground. It doesn't move forward any political agenda, nor does it take away any social cue or social convention that is there, nor does it stand in the way of Western ideals or Eastern ideals or any ideal on a practical level, on a practical level. So when we're discussing Islamic modernization, we're discussing these jurisprudential issues, the practical laws of Islam. And we are not discussing the beliefs. We are not discussing the beliefs. Rather, we say the beliefs are the same from Muhammad ibn Abdullah all the way until Adam alayhi salamullah. From the time of the Holy Prophet until now and backwards all the way until Adam, the beliefs stay the same. Yes, the shara'ah. The shara'ah, the way of life, the message of each and every prophet, Rasul, each and every messenger changes and it gives different laws for different time periods for different people. Yes, Musa alayhi salam brought down a set of laws that may have been very different than the set of laws that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought down and may have been very different than the laws of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But Islam Muhammad. Ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Islam of Musa and the Islam of Ibrahim are one and the same. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Ibrahim was not a Jew, nor was he a Christian. Rather, he was Hanifan Muslimah. He was a Muslim. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ and he was not from the polytheists. So when we discuss Islamic modernization, it's very clear that we are talking about the practical laws of Islam, the jurisprudential aspect of Islam, and not the beliefs. And not the beliefs. The beliefs we're going to be putting aside for now. Jemi. When it comes to the different theories, just like any other theory that's out there, just like any idea that there's discussion about, you always have the extremes, and then you have the ones in the middle. You always have people going to one extreme on one issue and the others on another extreme. And then you have people that float in the middle in the gray zone. When it comes to this issue, you have very much the same demographic of people. You have those that say Islam has to be modernized to the degree that we must change even what is set in stone. Even what is set in stone and clear. Then you have on the other end, those that say Islam is not to be modernized whatsoever. The way the Prophet used to dress, we dress. The way the Prophet used to eat, we eat. And what he used to eat. Yani if the Prophet وسلم, lived in Arabia, and in Arabia they didn't have cantaloupes. They didn't have watermelons. We are not allowed to eat watermelons. Because they didn't have it in Arabia. We must live the way people, the Prophet lived. Technology is to be thrown out the window. We must live like them, dress like them, eat the way they ate, eat what they ate, etc., 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 where they're on the opposite end of the spectrum altogether. And then we have those that float in the middle, not here and not here. Jimmy. As for the one on the far right, where they come forward and they say that Islam must be modernized to the fullest. And by the way, when I say right or left, I'm not, I'm not going to the political right and left, right? Because that's pretty much opposite, liberal versus conservative. When we go to the ones on the extreme end of modernization, on the extreme of modernization, we find that this issue of modernizing the rules by changing them and molding them is one that did not come up in the last 20 or 30 years. Rather, it's one that has been around for a long time has been around for a long time and is one that has been discussed thoroughly. And some of the most famous scholars, some of the most famous scholars have actually agreed to this idea. And when I say scholars, I'm not talking about Shia scholars, obviously. I'm talking about our Sunni brothers and sisters. For example, and a very prominent example, is Sheikh Muhammad Abdu. Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, my brothers and sisters, just a brief history, was a Sheikh that was living in Egypt. He was Sheikh Al-Azhar or one of the Sheikhs in Al-Azhar, the Azhar University, the big university, Islamic University in Egypt. His goal, my brothers and sisters, in his time 
was to bring the two sects together, the two Islamic sects together, the Shia and the Sunni, and also the other sects, bring them together. He was big on Islamic unity, trying to bring the different groups together under one path. And similarly, when turmoil hit Egypt and the Christians and the Muslims fought amongst themselves, he was a fundamental, he played a fundamental role in trying to bring the two groups together. In doing so, in doing so, we find that Muhammad Abdu, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, called for some very controversial views. Very controversial views. For example, it is said he made polygamy haram. He made polygamy haram. A man having multiple wives, more than one wife, marrying more than one wife, he made that haram. Although the ayah in the Quran, although the ayah in the Quran comes in the mutlaq form, does not put restrictions on the ayah he came forward and said no in in circumstances it becomes haram it becomes haram and these circumstances were not laid out in the sharia similarly it is said now although this this may not play a role practically speaking but it said he did join the freemasons and at the age of 28 for social and political views by the way freemasons there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of conspiracy theories about them but they were they are an actual group they are an actual group. Whether what, what's being said about them on the internet is more or less a, a conspiracy theory, but they are an actual real group of, of, of Jews. Jameel. That is Muhammad Abdu. Then you have another example, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida. Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida was also a Sunni scholar, a Sunni scholar that was influenced by the words of Sheikh Muhammad Abdu or vice versa. For example, he was a he was influenced by Darwinian evolution and he sympathized with the idea that human beings evolved over time and that Adam, please listen, and that Adam being the first man on earth was an idea that Muslims took from the Jews. Not that the Quran preaches such an idea, although it clearly does. He came forward and he said, Adam being the first man on earth was an idea that was preached by the Jews and the Muslims took on this idea and made it their own. So something so clearly stated in the Quran, he refuted and rejected and said it came from the Jews. So it's not surprising for you to see that Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rada also said the interest, for example, usury, interest, riba, was halal in some circumstances. It's not weird for you to see, for example, that he permitted the building of statues which we all know is haram, sculpting statues. He said, as long as it doesn't create any, um, any religious, uh, doesn't distort your religious belief about God, essentially, doesn't make people want to worship these statues, it's okay to do them. It's okay to sculpt them. Although the riwayat are very clear that whether you worship them or not, no, you can't. You can't. You can't actually sculpt them. Jamil. Jamil. So you find that this idea was there. Putting them aside, putting them aside, those were throughout history. Today, modern day and more modern Islam, today's day and age. Do we have people that are, do we have scholars or individuals out there that are calling for such ideas? 100% we do. Some of them are not known. Some of them don't necessarily have a word. They don't have, they're not famous enough to influence. Some of them are very influential. Some of them are very influential. And some of them even live in Shia countries. For example, there is a known thinker in Qum, modern day Qum today, that is, a, is very, very, very uh, influenced by this idea that Islam must be modernized. He comes forward and he says that Islam must be modernized for many different reasons. For many different reasons. Number one, number one, he says, for example, he gives an example. He says that when we come and we call for the modernization of Islam, we will sometimes go against the Quran and what it explicitly says. But we have to understand his words. We have to understand that the Quran, the ahkam mentioned in the Quran, are merely a method of application that the Prophet ﷺ applied. And that method of application can change through the years and change through the ages. He gives the example. He says, for example, in the Quran, it is said the person who steals and, and they, you know, there's certain conditions that are met, 
His hand is to be cut. Jamil. He says, this was merely an application for the time of Rasulullah to give justice to those that stole. To take justice from those who stole. Today, in our day and age, justice is taken in a different manner. And so we must conform to the method of punishment of today. So today, when you rob a bank or you steal from a store, you're taken to jail and you're put in jail for five years. Mathala. That is what is equivalent to cutting your hand at the time of the Prophet. And cutting of the hand at the time of the Prophet and the Imams was merely an application. Merely an application. The way Rasulullah applied this law and the uh, application of Rasulullah does not necessarily have to be that way that we apply it in today's day and age. When you look at it, it's sparkly and decorative. <laughs> when you first hear it, it's sparkly and decorative and seems to make sense. But then when you go and you look at it and say, Tayyib, what are you going to do with the ayat of the Quran? No, we go against it. We go against it. We apply something different altogether. We apply something different altogether. All, all together. Tayyib, what is the ayah in the Quran? Then what does it serve? Merely scripture? This is one, you know, one idea being pushed. Similarly, when he comes to speak about women's rights in Islam, he comes and he says that the reason why Rasulullah couldn't give a woman her rights in Islam, assuming that a woman doesn't have any rights in Islam, but the reason why, this is his word, the reason why Rasulullah couldn't give a woman her rights in Islam is because the people at the time would not accept such a thing. And so if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a woman her full rights, the people would not accept such a thing. And if people would not accept such a thing, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to restrict certain things, keep certain things to himself, not speak about them because he would lose essentially the followers. And so Rasulullah did not propagate such an idea, did not come and call for the rights of a woman in Islam. This is what is being said. Jami. Now that we understand the theory, now that we understand what was being said and some of the reasons behind what's being said, let's look and, and sort of try to dissect each and every one of these rules or one of these, sorry, theories and why they said what they said. And let's, let's, see, what we can, let's see what we can sort of come up with together. As for the idea that the application of Rasulullah changes or the application of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not necessarily have to be the application of today. We can say this. When it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, when it comes to the way that he spread the message, when it comes to him spreading the message, we not only take the message as a message, but we also take the application of Rasulullah for what it was. And we call this Amr Tawqifi. Listen, there's an actual word in the Hawza for this. This is why it's surprising that such individuals are saying this. This is what we call Amr Tawqifi. What's Amr Tawqifi? Al Amr Tawqifi is an issue, is an, is an application, is a hadith, is a command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is to be followed to the T and not to be transgressed over. When Rasulullah tells you, pray for rak'at for Salat al-Dhuhr, that is Amr Tawqifi, where Salat al-Dhuhr can never be three rak'at and can never be five rak'at. Whether you understand or not, it doesn't change the fact that it's going to have to be four. So in other words, we do waqf, we stop at the hadith. What the hadith says, we go with and we don't transgress. Number one. Number two, we come and we define the sunnah of Rasulullah as three things. Stay with me. The sunnah of Rasulullah is defined as three things. The tradition of Rasulullah is defined as three things. Number one, qawlul ma'asum. The words of the ma'asum. The words of the ma'asum. Ithnan. Second, what? The action of the ma'asum, the application of the ma'asum. When the ma'asum, when the in infallible being, when the prophet or the imam, takes the message and applies it, manifests it through his actions. Rasulullah stands in front of you and does wudu. And then he walks away, he doesn't say a word to you. 
That's the application. That right there is, is application. The ayah in the Quran says, wash your faces, wash your hands, do this, do that, wipe your head, wipe your feet. Like how? Rasulullah comes and takes the, takes the verse and applies it and shows you. What's application? Application is taking something that is there that may be vague and telling you the details through the action, showing you the details of the verse, taking away the ambiguity of that verse through application, through doing something. That is what application is. The words of the ma'asum. The actions of the ma'asum. And taqreerul ma'asum. Even more than this. Even more than application. Taking it a step further. What's taqreer? The acceptance of the ma'asum. We're going to flip it now. I go to the ma'asum and say, Ya Imam, I'm going to do wudu in front of you. I do wudu in front of the Imam. The Imam looks at me, turns away and goes and walks away. Turns and walks away. Doesn't tell me my wudu is wrong. Then I know for sure my wudu is right. Because he accepted it. He signed off on it. Said yes, no problem. He didn't say anything. But by him not telling me anything. In that circumstance. When I finish the wudu. Then I know that my wudu was right. Because if it was wrong. He would have said anything. He would have said something. Qawl al-ma'asum. Fa'al al-ma'asum. Taqreer al-ma'asum. Jameel. This is one refutation. Like when it comes to the women, when it comes to women's rights, who said women don't have the rights in Islam? According to what? And assuming that was the case, let's go far and say that's the case. Like we can refute this in two ways. We refute it through al-hal and refute it through al-naqd. Al-hal is a method by which you refute something by taking the idea and fragmenting it, analyzing it, dissolving it, and finding the problem within it. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was not able to tell the people of the message that he was sent with, then why was he sent with the message? Yani if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had to fear the people, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam begin the message in the beginning? Number one. Number two, who said Rasulullah didn't call for women's rights? A woman was not able to have any land back then. A woman was taken from house to house. A woman was treated as an object. A woman was so degraded that they used to kill their own children because she was a girl. That she was going to be a woman. And then after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, a woman was able to have land. A woman was respected. A woman was able to start a business on her own. There was some sort of independence that was given to the woman where she was able to earn. A woman was given the right dowry out of respect and value and out of respect for her, her economic status as an individual in society. That's through al-hal. You analyze it and fragment it. Tayyib, al-naqad, we give an example. Tayyib, the example of Fatima alayhi salam She was not given her right. Who was standing in the way of Rasulullah than giving Fatima or Sayyid Khadija her right? Number one. Number two, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to these people, their lives were what? Their lives were women, money and alcohol. Their lives was what? what, what the time of Jahiliyyah was comprised of what? Women, money, alcohol. Taib Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to get these people to put money aside and live for their akhirah, to leave the dunya. And live for their akhirah. The man that yesterday was bowing to a golden calf, a golden statue, today has left the world and is sleeping in the masjid. Tayyib, he was able to get these people that were drunk on a daily basis to leave alcohol, not just leave it, consider it rijis min amal shaitan, consider it to be najasa, dirtiness from the acts of Satan. People that were bent on alcoholic beverages. They used to not even be able to live without alcohol. They used to get drunk inside the Kaaba. More than that, he was, able to, he was able to strip such a thing from them. He was not able to give a woman her rights. He was not able to say, women, you have one, two, three, such, a, such, such and such rights. That today we have to come and, and add and subtract and, and mold and change. No. No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all, my brothers and sisters. When it comes to the Sharia, when it comes to the laws of Islam, 
those who truly understand the meaning of the Sharia and what the Sharia is calling for. And those who have understood the words of Ahlul Bayt would not dare say such a thing. Would not dare say such a thing. Because a third year, fourth year Hausa student that is actually in Najaf or Qum can refuse such an idea. There are reasons behind these ideas, my brothers and sisters. And watch out, please. Please, I, I beg you, watch out. There, is re there are reasons why these ideas are pushed. There are reasons why the loudest of people are pushing these ideas. And I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you now. I'm angry. I'm going to tell you now. I was once sitting in a lecture in London. I'm going to honestly say it. I'm not going to say names, but I'm going to be very frank on this. I was once sitting in a lecture in London. London, England. I was visiting a, I was visiting a, a mosque that I had the honor of reciting in. I was visiting the brothers and sisters there. Jemmy. They had a speaker up on the pulpit. They had a speaker on the pulpit. And they were talking about slavery. Slavery in Islam. This was the topic. Like, okay, great. Great topic. Talking about slavery in Islam. After the lecture, which was, which was actually given by another uh, scholar. Um, great lecture, actually. There was another prominent speaker sitting beside him. They were talking about slavery in Islam. You know I mean? The crowd started to ask questions. And very easily, who are they asking the questions to? They're not asking the sheikh. They're talking to the prominent speaker that's known there because he has modern views. So they ask him. If today's time, in today's day and age, or in today's day and age, the rules pertaining to slavery, the rules pertaining to slavery, do they apply? Simple question. Islam has rules pertaining to slavery. Like, do, those, do those rules apply? Yes or no? This person, he got scared. If he said yes, he's going to get booed. Or he's going to lose views. Or he's going to lose followers on Instagram or Facebook. And by the way, I'm very much straightforward with these things. He's going to lose views. Like, if he says no, he's going against the Sharia. So Tayyip, what does he say? This idea of halal Muhammad halal until the day of judgment. And haram Muhammad haram until the day of judgment. This idea is being discussed between the scholars. This idea is being, this is being debated between the scholars. And so what was halal at the time of the Prophet is not halal today. Wallah. Really. This is what it was. A person who studied Hawza would have easily said, Akhi, for every hukum, there is a mawdu'a. For every ruling, there is a place where that ruling sits and it's applied. If there is no mawdu'a, there is no hukum. If there is no place where that ruling is to be applied, there's no ruling. If there are no slaves today, then the rulings will not apply. A fourth, fifth year Hausa student could have, could have answered such a question. But because this person was cornered, he had to resort to these ideas. There is a lot, my brothers and sisters, at stake. And there are many people pushing, pushing these ideas because they go with they go very much and they are aligned with a lot of political propaganda. A lot of political, political ideas that are being are trying to be pushed. Social reform. They align with social reform. And simply put, simply put, there's a lot of pressure by the West on Muslims in particular to conform because we are pretty much the only religion that is holding on to a tradition today. The Bible has been changed. The Torah, God knows what's happened to that. Go to the Old Testament and you can see the, the absurdities in the Old Testament. Some of the, which we read, some of which I am not even able to say on the, on, on the computer, by the way. Go see. Go to the other religions and see what has happened to them. See how their religions have become a game. Have become a game in the hands of those in power. See how Christmas has become not even a religious holiday anymore. Similar to the other Kwanzaa and, and, and the other, the other uh, Shusmu, and the other holidays as well, where religions are being used for business, where religions are being used to push agendas. Islam is the only religion in the world that's holding on to a tradition. The only religion in the world in which its book, the Quran, has not been changed for 1,400 years. So it makes sense that you don't attack the books, you don't attack the hadiths, you don't attack the scriptures, you attack the people. 
Go to the people and tell them your religion is living a thousand four hundred years in the past and try to find a way. Try to find a way to prove that to them so that they themselves call for reform from within. So that they themselves become the cancer from within, calling to change the religion to suit who? To suit these governments, to suit the political agenda, to suit those in power. To suit those that are trying to gain for themselves. So that Eid, so that Eid tomorrow can become the same way as Christmas has become. So that your religion itself can preach things such as interest. So that your religion itself can allow a woman to walk, for example, without the proper hijab and no hijab whatsoever and even more than that. More than that, where women today are becoming objectified, etc., 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 by the media specifically. Not that a woman that doesn't wear hijab is objectified. Astaghfirullah, not what I meant. But where women today in the media are becoming objectified. So tell the people today that hijab is no longer wajib because the world doesn't accept it. And then, yes, you will have more and more people following that trend, etc. And the list goes on, my brothers and sisters. The list goes on. Islam, Islam is pure in its teachings. Islam has been pure in its teachings and will always stay pure in its teachings. No matter who stands up, no matter who sits down, no matter the different theories that come about, no matter who pu pushes and presses for these theories to change, it will stay as pure as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa brought it. And it's, it's on us to preserve that, my brothers and sisters. It's on us to preserve that. The way that we preserve it is by, by staying steadfast, by understanding the ahkam instead of running away from them, by learning the ahkam, by learning the rules, learning the teachings instead of trying to change them, my brothers and sisters. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين